Here we are. You know, they say little drops of water makes the mighty ocean. You live your life in drops. And uh, until someone attempts to bring it all together, you probably don't realize what you've done. So I guess for all of us, we're writing a book. It's the storybook of our lives. And I hope that by the time we sign out, which is when you die, you know, that we would like the story that we would have written. That's got to be our consciousness. That's one thing we must all wake up and go to sleep being conscious of. That what have I added to the book of my life today by the things that I've done? I think you'll be surprised how he keeps you in check and keeps you focused on what is important. And reminds you that indeed you are writing a book. Your children will read that book. And the question is, will you be proud of what you would have written by the things you've done every day. When you remember that, you will take different kinds of decisions on a daily basis. We're talking about the road to sustainable growth for Nigerian entrepreneurs. And, you know, it's good to qualify it and put Nigerian entrepreneur. Why? Because our landscape is specific to us. There are many things that are global about the issues that we deal with, but there are many things that are completely local about the environment in which we're operating. But you know, what is also local about us is who Nigerians are. And that is one thing we tend to discount and we don't give ourselves enough credit for. Because you think about the issues we wake up with in the morning. You go to bed tonight, yesterday night. And this morning when you wake up, you're not really sure what issues have come up in your life. Or in your business life. And yet, there are many of us in this room who continue to navigate and to survive. I remember in 2004, and I'm sure in case someone in furniture would remember this. When the government, one evening on network news, announced that every form of furniture was banned from being imported into Nigeria without defining clearly what that meant. So every material, every related component, everything was shut down first before they start discovering that, oh, no, we did this, oh, no, this is not meant to be there then you help them to redefine. And a Spanish friend of mine came to meet me in Barcelona. And he said to me, your government changed policy two months ago. I said, yes. And you are already working on the way forward. I said, yes. So he was like, how? How do you turn around yourself so quickly and begin to think of how to move forward in the midst of it. I said, well, because I'm a Nigerian. I go to sleep expecting something to happen tomorrow. And therefore, the creativity that is within the Nigerian is at play all of the time. But there are things that are critical and fundamental and that you must never drop. And it's even more important for building a sustainable business in our environment. And those things are not even the hard business things that you consider. It's not your power. It's not your infrastructure. It's not financing. It's not any of those core business factors of production or issues. It's about what you set out to do. And who you have chosen to be. Because when you get into the thorny environment of our country, who you are will help you to define what story you're writing. So when that moment of 2004 came, I 
had been in business for about 15 years then. I'd started a manufacturing business at the age of 25 going to 26. And all the factors that were present then are still present. There was no power. There's still no power. All the many, in fact, things are better now. Because you have options for financing. We had none. We had absolutely nothing. A young girl, slim-legged, looking for money for who, on which bank? Nobody was going to get There were no microfinance banks. I remember Citibank would not even open an account for me. It's too small, too young, too small to do business with. It was interesting when they came later to ask for my account. I said, you're never getting it. <laughs> if you weren't there when I needed someone, why should I give you any right to anything? I give it to the guys who were there. When you face situations that come up, you remember what you said to do. So in that moment, within that season, I had to ask myself what I set out to do and what I'd been trying to do for the last 15 years. At that point, now we will be 29 years in January. At that moment, I reminded myself that I set out to build an institution that I would be proud of. I remember that the reason I started the business at all was because after my youth service, the first job I could get was in a furniture company. And I'd gone there to work whilst trying to get a job in a bank. I left after three and a half months to start my own because I discovered I loved what I was doing there, but I hated their value system as a business. And I said to myself, I can do this and do it with a different set of value system, the way I had been brought up and the things I considered important and right to do. That was the nucleus of my move to start the company. So when I got to a major crossroad, of course, by this time, my faith had become a major part of my life and my business. I had to ask myself, okay, so now you're in troubled waters. Do you remind yourself of who you are or who you set out to be? Or do you conform to what the generality says is necessary to survive in the new landscape. You could not legally bring all of those furniture components into Nigeria. I would have to act in legally to continue. And a lot of people did, and they're still doing it now. But I said to myself, based on my faith and my relationship with God, that I can't take the good times and when the challenges come, I change my confession. And that whatever it is that I had to do without giving up on that business and building it for the long term is what I had to do. Now, follow me. The moment I made that decision, the problem became different. Because I then had to look for solutions of the laws of the land and yet create value for building my business forward. Well, it is out of that crisis that I had the courage to go to the largest French manufacturer of office seating who sells all around the world. It's one of the top ten in the world and had no production anywhere else but in France. Or they had invested in like 20 SME companies around Europe that were supplying them with components. Was Nigeria going to be their place of investment? It didn't seem likely. In fact, the first time I went to them, they laughed. But I knew something they didn't know. I knew that I wasn't giving up on my vision based on my values. And I said to them, 
come with me and build an institution that would take control of this product segment. He said I should give them some time. I left. See, when you have no choice, you will fight. I hadn't given myself the choice of the compromised option. And therefore, I could fight to push the boundary to try to achieve what I knew was right and sustainable over the long term. After two weeks, they called me back and said, you know what, Ms. Aushika? We'll partner with you in a JV. We'll do about 5% investment and we'll give you all the technical support. All I needed was a window to open. I knew that I will eventually kick the door in. About four months after that, as we built the business plan and everything, Guarantee Trust Bank, who were my bankers and one of my biggest customers, seeing that these guys had signed the first MOU, decided they're seriously coming with you. I said, yes, they are. So it was the period of SME, IES, or whatever fund. And they were looking for corporate investments under that fund. They said, can we invest in this? And I said, yes, you can. So they came in. Two other individuals said, can we put money in this? And I said, yes, you can. And Sokwa France then came back and said, as they saw the business plan come together, it became far more attractive. And they said, you know what? Our board just met. We're not doing 5%. We're moving our investment to 21%. Full technical support, training of everybody and everything and all of that. Everything we had to do offshore, they took care of it. Machinery, searching for this, getting rights, patent rights for different things and stuff. We were riding on the back of a company that produces tens of millions of pieces, as opposed to us, and working at their rate because they were a JV partner. We were working into skills and technology they had built over decades. We didn't have to start from ground zero. We were moving with a brand power that immediately made us attractive to European companies that were working in the terrain or foreign companies coming into Nigeria who knew who they were. How did we get there? Simply because we eliminated the option of compromise and chose the value option. And once we made the choice to do things right, a way to do it right and then doors that we didn't know would ever open opened up that relationship has continued till now as a matter of fact right now everybody out of the Sokoa Alliance because we're consolidating our companies based on the environment it's the wisest thing for us to do and Sokoa decided they didn't want to leave in fact it was a major conversation. So what we've agreed right now is no problem. We warehouse the value of your exit share. Reach the consolidation, you reinvest in the main company. So they are partner for life based on how what it started from what I just narrated to you. Why is this important? It's easy to go into the issue of, oh, power, this. You know why I have discounted them? Because some of the businesses that you see that are great businesses around Nigeria right now, we're all built without those things. That shows you that Nigeria has its own economy that works even within its problems. And Nigerians have the capacity to work through it and still build things. Sometimes I've thought to myself, if I built this company in a country where everything worked, it would probably be 10 or 100 times its size because everything would be available to you. But maybe not. What you must understand is, for you to build your business on a sustainable model, there's some fundamental things that you must consider. You must be clear of what, where you want to go. So that when the seasons change, it doesn't change where you want to go. 
Oh, where you want to go can be defined because there must be some level of flexibility. So you might adapt it to the environment and stuff like that. But you must have a sense of why you started in the first place. You must be sure of what the value system of your company will be. And if you are clear about your value system, then you will treat your customers right. You will treat your workers right. You will be fair to your suppliers. You will build for the long term because business has a major relationship angle. So what you all have in your hand is a seed. An entrepreneur is a farmer with a seed of an idea. You feed that idea with different things. But you give it a chance to grow and grow well or not. You choose to make your seed grass or a palm tree. Why? If it's grass, you throw anything and everything at it quickly to get results. And like grass, it and overtake everywhere. But how many months down the line? Six months? Twelve months? What happens to it? It begins to wither and it dries off. And that's why every person in this room today will know of someone who was in business, who seemed to have succeeded so quickly around you, in your business, in your industry. You know, in our industry, in the furniture industry, it's the girls that survived. It's true. The question is, that's, that's a good question. And we are the manufacturer. It's the girls that survived. We're more patient. We're mothers. We nurture. We build. No. It, 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 was inter it was someone that made a note. It was a guy, one of the guys in the industry. When we were all starting, we were all young. It was one of the guys that pointed it out to me one day and said, you know, it's amazing. I think it was the day Monisha Barra was opening her new factory then. And the person said, you know, it's amazing. It's you girls that survived. I said, well, I didn't want to rub it in. So I let him off. But that tells you there's something to learn from. Something for the women and everybody else to learn from the men. I'm a mother of all boys. I even don't have a girl in my I'm the only girl in our house. So you can understand that uh, I can't be one-sided. But women are more patient, should be. They nurture more. They're more accommodating. They try to find a way around every situation. It's how you keep peace between all the children and all of that. In business, those factors are at play. You're trying to find the balance between the things that you wake up with and the ones you go to bed with. And managing all the factors without giving up. But yet being open to new ideas. Understanding that all the people that work for you, they're not dummies. They've got something to give. Facing the fact every day that you're not the most important person in your business. You just happen to be the one that held the seed. That every single person from your gate man to the nearest person to you has got value to give. And you must treat them as assets. Because in life, you only succeed by combining assets plus assets to get success. But every human being is an asset plus liability. And your liability is only eradicated by the assets of the people that work for you, for you to get the second part of the asset in order to achieve success. So when you want to build for the long term, don't be in a hurry. Don't consume your dinner for breakfast. And what that means to me is, learn to retain resources for the future of the company. Don't be in a hurry to ride the Range Rover or the Rolls Royce. They will come. When the time comes, you would be spoiled for choice. That's the truth. But you must be patient. Give the business what it needs and build along. It's also how you become the darling of the bankers. Because when you show that credibility, Or resources you would find it's easy to tell your story from your financial records
A lot of people don't understand. You don't need to know how to write a business plan to get a bank credit. Take all your bank statements there. They will write the story from it. And they can tell if you're worth investing in or not. That's the truth. So, especially the guys, the first million you make, or the first few millions, is not for the fancy car. And for the girls, it's not for the nice jewelry. It's for something bigger. There's a point you will get to where you'll have all of it in excess. For many years, I didn't buy a car. I'm telling you the truth. I didn't have a car. I used to take chartered taxi with a driver. I'll charter the taxi and pay per hour. When, if the taxi breaks down, what happens? Is this my problem? It's the guy's problem. I get out and take the next one. And I move on. And I remember Tyra Derokun used to harass me. You this Ijebu girl. I'm not an Ijebu girl to start with. Go and buy a car. we like, car? When I remember the next machine that I need to buy for the factory. But a day came. The credibility, the tenacity, the result of staying with it and building right for the long term all came together. So yes, I can be the chairman of First Bank of Nigeria today. First female in 122 years. But it wasn't by seeking it or by owning shares in it. It was simply the things I did every day. And I didn't realize that they held as much value as they did. And a time came when the market itself was seeking for people like you and I. People who knew how to build from nothing. Who knew how to create value and stay with it. People who if they have been conscious of it, kept their values and built right. And when those, when that day came, you start getting the phone calls. And then you realize that you say no to more boards than you say yes to. Because unfortunately, they're not enough that have taken the time to write that story. So I'm saying to you today, you have a seed. It is a seed. It can grow to become anything. It depends on what you water it with. You have the power to make the choice. Because what you're doing is a national service. Building businesses in Nigeria today is a matter of emergency. It's the only way we will create the jobs. The multinationals can't do it. We're the largest bank in the country employing the largest number of people. But even at First Bank, we employ maybe about 17, 18,000 people. Check what the others employ. What does that tell you? The entire stock exchange, all the companies listed on it, cannot account for 500,000 jobs. That's the truth. So you are the key. So it's important that as many SME companies succeed as is possible, but the choice to make it succeed is yours. It's the decisions you make every day. And remember, it's bigger than you. It's important for you to do it right. Apart from the fact that you're expressing your dream, it's also because you get to build a legacy and to affect the lives of other people positively. You know, Tokumba is sitting there quietly. He thought he wanted to be a banker. Until being a banker showed him that opportunities were sitting there that he had more than enough capacity to take hold of. I'm ever so proud of him and what he has done, stepping out from where he was into the risky terrain of building from scratch. Dedication will always show results. And that's why, I don't know, he's talking about Allah being incorporated because you have to count how many companies are involved in what is called the Superflux Group right now and the value that has been created. And the passion and the heart of a Nigerian who seeks to do things right. So I challenge you. Don't build just for your pocket money. Don't build businesses just so you can buy a car or rent a flat or build a house or do whatever. Those are byproducts. You will get them. They will come. As a matter of fact, I think for the last how many years, I haven't had to use my own money to buy any car. I don't need to. But remember, I didn't buy a car when I really should have. 
I chose the taxes. When I bought my first car, it was a used car. It's true. When I bought my second car, it was a used car. By this time, I think by God knows when, I was already turning over God knows how much. But I was more consumed with building from one business to the other and the other and building the group and making the investment. When I got my first brand new car, I think my husband just got tired. He was sure this girl would never use her money to buy it and bought me one. And it was on my 40th birthday. It's true. Because I was more consumed with building the business. So I'm saying to you, you might not want to suffer like I did. But whatever you do, make sure that along the path of doing it, you're building what will outlive you and what will change the lives of other people in our country. Thank you very much for listening to me. <laughs>